Good evening, everybody. My name is Alex Vines. I'm one of the directors at Chatham House, and I'm your host tonight. Very welcome to you all. I'm delighted this evening that we can host here the President, His Excellency John Mahama, President of Ghana. He will be speaking on Ghana's democratic gains, economic change, and regional influence. This is really welcoming back the President because uh, he visited Chatham House as Vice President on, on Trade and Energy Policy in July 2010. Uh, Ghana is, of course, a country that Chatham House does a considerable amount of work on. The former President, President John Kufo, has spoken here. Indeed, he won the Chatham House Prize. We've also had various other ministers of the Ghana government speaking here, but also uh, opposition, Nano Kufuadu, the presidential candidate of the New Patriotic Party, visited Chatham House in February 2012 in the run-up to last year's elections to talk about his vision for Ghana. But today, it's about the president of Ghana, President Mahama, talking about the democratic gains that Ghana has, has achieved, its economic change and regional influence. This meeting is on the record, and uh, therefore, um, there are journalists in the room and very welcome to report and record. I'm delighted to offer the platform to His Excellency uh, to give his presentation. Excellency, welcome back to Chatham House. Thank and you. over to you, if you'd like to get to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased and happy to be back here after several years. I remember I was invited to give a talk here uh, in 2010, as uh, the moderator said. And that time, the topic was on Ghana's um, emerging oil and gas industry. Today, I'm asked to talk on Ghana's democratic gains, economic change, and regional influence. But I guess that Ghana should be taken in a context, and that's the context of Africa. So I'm going to be talking both about Africa and Ghana, almost interchangeably. But I think that some of the things you see happening in Ghana are happening elsewhere in Africa. In 2004, when FIFA announced that South Africa had been chosen to host the 2010 World Cup, the entire continent was overjoyed. Never before had the World Cup been held on African soil. Thabo Mbeki, South Africa's president at the time, said, and I quote, Africa's time has come. We want to ensure that one day historians will reflect upon the 2010 World Cup as the moment when Africa stood tall and resolutely turned the tide on centuries of poverty and conflict. Quotations closed. The teams of six African nations qualified to play in the World Cup. There was South Africa, Nigeria, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Algeria, and of course, my own country, Ghana. The crowd that assembled in the Johannesburg Stadium in June 2010 for the opening ceremony of the games was a microcosm of the entire continent. The energy was electrifying from the thunderous beating of drums to the deafening blares of, I'm sure you remember that instrument, Vuvuzelas. <laughs> Not since the days of independence from colonial rule had Africans seemed so united in their sense of determination in their expectation of victory. Never mind that apartheid had only officially ended in South Africa in 1992. And that was the first year that country's team, Bafana Bafana, played their first match. It was the same year that Ghana, my country, returned to multi-party democracy in 1992. Never mind that Cote d'Ivoire was only seven years out of a debilitating civil war, or that in Nigeria, acts of religious violence were on the rise, or that Cameroon was in the midst of serious economic turmoil, 
or that Algeria was already witnessing small waves of social unrest that would ultimately erupt in large-scale protests, never mind any of them. It would be extremely poetic to say that when the squads of those six nations marched onto the field, nothing else mattered except the game. But that's not altogether true. Everything mattered. The world's eyes were focused on Africa. It was our moment, and there was a point to be proven. There was history to be made. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't need to tell you what happened next. Unfortunately, one by one, our teams were eliminated. But a test, as a testament to our solidarity and the continent's desire to achieve success on that international stage, Every time an African team was eliminated, its fans shifted their support and allegiance to one of the other remaining African nations. <laughs> Soon enough, Ghana's Black Stars, the only African team to advance to round, the round of 16 and then the quarterfinals, found itself carrying the hope of the entire continent on its shoulders. Sports and politics have always had a special, almost symbolic relationship. The Greek philosopher Plato once said, and I quote, you can discover more about a person in an hour of play than in one year of conversation. Quotations close. I believe that's also true of a nation. Whether and how a nation performs on the playing field says as much about the nation as whether and how it performs on the battlefield or in the ballot box. The Black Stars' performance in the 2010 World Cup, not unlike their performance in the 2006 World Cup, is a good an indicator as any of Ghana's role regionally and throughout the continent, as well as on the international stage. Ghana first gained the reputation of being a trailblazer when in 1957, it became the first sub-Saharan African country to gain independence. But that's old news. The real story is that since then, despite whatever difficulties the country has faced, we've never been satisfied to merely rest on those laurels. Ghana continues to make news and maintain its relevance. Over the years, Ghana has solidified its reputation with the various advances that it has made. Advances in the demonstration of democracy and the rule of law, advances in healthcare delivery, advances in technology and communications, and indeed advances in our economic growth. I use Ghana's performance in the World Cup as a metaphor to open this talk, because as is often the case in conversations about Africa, the emphasis tends to not be on the gains that have been made, but the small but significant victories. Sorry, let me take that again. I use Ghana's performance in the World Cup as a metaphor to open this talk, because as is often the case in conversations about Africa, the emphasis tends to not be on the gains that have been made, the small but significant victories, but rather on the isolated wins or losses. This sort of binary system is far too simplistic a method of judgment for the complex nature of Africa and its countries, and Ghana stands as a prime example. Despite winning the Africa Cup of Nations four times, 2006 was still the first time that Ghana had qualified for the Senior FIFA World Cup. Still, we took the lead for Africa, going as far as the round of 16. In 2010, we once again took the lead and that time we went even further to the quarterfinals. With this type of progress, one can only imagine where the future will find us, both on the football field and in reality. What I'm here to talk about today is neither success nor failure. I'm here to talk about progress. Ghana's first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, famously said, we face neither east nor west. We face forward. I'm here to talk about the strides that Ghana has made and is continuing to make 
and the importance of us maintaining that pace of not looking left or right at what other nations are doing or where they are going, but as Dr. Nkrumah said, facing forward and paving our own road into the future. Why? Because being a trailblazer can be both a blessing and a burden. A blessing in that it is always wonderful for one's achievements to be recognized. A burden in that, along with this recognition, is a built-in expectation of sustained success. It is an expectation that does not allow enough room for the patience that is necessary to account for progress, which can often be seen, which can be, often seem slow, especially for a developing nation like Ghana. You see, depending on the vantage point you stand, progress and success are not always one and the same thing. I'd like to share with you a portrait of two different countries, Ghana of 2000 and Ghana of today. In 2000, there was a 4.7% prevalence rate of HIV AIDS. In 2012, the prevalence rate was 1.3%. In 2000, the rate of maternal deaths was 600 deaths per 100,000. By 2012, that rate had been halved to 300 deaths per 100,000. In 2000, average life expectancy in Ghana was 54 years, about. In 2012, it's 62 years. In 2000, the per capita income was around $420. Today, it's at about $1,500. When these portraits are placed side by side, when you look at where we are today as compared to where we were in 2000, there's a tendency to use the word success. And in fact, we have been successful in our efforts to manifest change. Yet, success is such a finite word, one that suggests an immediacy of action one that implies arrival at a destination. Progress can be deceptive because although it is easy to recognize over long stretches of time, it can be difficult to see on a day-to-day -day basis because it also encompasses the minor setbacks that when viewed in the short term can be labeled as failure. I suspect that during the 12 year span of time that existed between these two portraits of Ghana, there were a number of setbacks and impediments that temporarily kept our nation standing still. I suspect that if questioned on any given day during the 12 year time, time span, the average citizen, sorry, let me take that again. I suspect that if questioned on any given day during the 12 year span of time, the average citizen might have readily complained about the lack of progress that was being made. This seeming lack of progress is a common complaint in many developing nations. And Ghana, despite usually being at the forefront of change and achievement on the continent, is no exception. That is why it is crucial for us to change the way in which we frame our conversations about Africa. It is crucial that we consider not just the attainment of an end goal, but the small and steady advances that are being made to reach that goal. By changing the way in which we frame our discussions about Africa, we also change the unrealistic expectations of overnight success and the discouraging notion of failure when those expectations are not immediately met. The lens through which we view Africa must show a realistic depiction of what is actually happening on the continent and how these events are affecting the lives of ordinary people. Throughout the centuries, Africa has existed in the world's imagination in myriad ways. We have been depicted as a dark continent, a den of exotic diseases, an annex of adventure and safari. We have been cast in a fairy tale of freedom, one in which the attainment of independence was thought to proffer a happy ending. We have been pitied as the perpetually impoverished land, the place of political upheaval, the place where everything bad can and usually does happen. And we have been patronized by the media, by donors, and by aid organizations. 
all this notwithstanding, Africa has persevered. So much so that half of the countries in the top 10 list of the fastest growing economies in the world today are in Africa. However, the fact of that achievement does not negate the existence of other areas in those countries that need to be improved. Ghana, with a GDP of $34 billion in 2012, as compared to $18.7 billion in 2006, finds itself atop that list of fast-growing economies. Yet we also find ourselves struggling to meet the challenges posed by a fast-growing population. Challenges such as the creation of more jobs to curb the rate of youth unemployment and the rapid expansion of an infrastructure that no longer adequately serves our nation's needs. If we're able to look into the future, we would very well be able to paint a picture of Ghana we would find then and compare it to a picture of Ghana we find today. And we'd be able to clearly see the progress that is being made right now to move us towards that future. Sustainable change is rarely immediate. It is measured, a process of step after painstaking step being taken in the direction of an intended target or goal. The role that patients plays in this process cannot be understated. The absence of patience ultimately leads to the absence of direction. It is that patience and the keen sense of focus it engenders which has enabled Ghana throughout the years to time and time again be a trailblazer on the African continent in politics, in sports, and in the improvement of the lives of our citizens. Tomorrow, along with 17 other nations, Ghana is set to receive an award from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization for its progress in reaching the Millennium Development Goal of decreasing hunger and undernourishment. The award is being given to countries that have met the target of cutting the percentage of people in their population suffering from hunger and undernourishment between the years 90, 1990 uh, to uh, 2012, 1990, to 2010, uh, uh, 2012. That is cutting the number of people suffering from hunger and undernourishment by half. In 1990, the prevalence of undernourishment in Ghana's population was 34%. In 2000, that figure was 11.1%. By 2012, that figure was reduced even further to 5%. I'm almost certain that tomorrow when Ghana and the other nations are honored for their achievements, the eyes of the entire world will not be trained on that stage. There will not be a stadium full of people beating on drums and blowing into vuvuzelas. Nevertheless, history will have been made. This is the nature of progress and the reward for patience that it demands. It happens in minor but consistent increments. It more often than not goes unnoticed. And then finally one day, when enough ground has been gained, it is announced, bam, and labeled a success. Until then, and even after then, we continue to face forward. We continue to take step after painstaking step. We continue to make progress in all areas of our citizens' lives so that Ghana can live up to the full promise of its vast potential. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Your Excellency. The moment now is for questions and clarifications. So there are roving microphones moving around uh, the auditorium here. Uh, please do tell us who you are and also your, your, uh, keep your questions succinct. I'm trying to, I will try and do as many questions as possible and the hands are going up straight away. So that hand is right near the microphone. So let's start there. Over to you, sir. Please.
please tell us who you are. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Chidi Warner. I'm a member of Chatham House. Uh, just a very good speech, so thank you very much for that. I just uh, wanted to ask a question slightly on a topic that maybe you didn't uh, cover, but it's uh, related to, obviously, um, you know, the, the advent of democracy in West Africa. Um, Ghana's contribution to the operations in Mali were, I think, a company of um, engineers. Previously, Ghana, you know, you know credit, uh, performed very creditably in Syria alone, Liberia, you know, Rwanda, you know, performed with great honor and, uh, and verve. So it's a bit strange that for a crisis that is quite close to home, Ghana didn't, you know, um, send a greater force or contribute a lot more. Uh, was that a matter of a lack of capability or was it, you know, uh, prudence uh, on behalf of Ghana? And, you know, following on from that, the two powers, or what I would say, the two nations in West Africa that seem to be projecting power the, the most are um, Chad and possibly uh, Niger and Burkina Faso seems to be acting as, as power brokers. Again, we've seen Burkina Faso from the days of Liberia, Syria alone, et cetera. Is this, again, a factor of these countries being non-democratic countries and therefore the leaders who, are unlike yourself, do not have to account to their populace? So is that, would you put this down as something that is maybe a negative, or a ne negative second order consequence of um, you know, democracy? Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you answer that question straight away and then I'll start clustering them. Okay, I'll, I'll start from the, the second part of the question. It is the question of proximity. Burkina Faso, Niger, and Chad are some of the countries closest to Mali. And so if there's any brokering of peace, I think that the responsibility is better discharged by them than any of our other countries. But all of us have a commitment to Mali and all of us have a commitment to guaranteeing the sovereignty of Mali. Ghana contributed a company of engineers to provide logistic support and construction engineering, not because we're not committed to the Mali project, but because Ghana has a huge contingent in peacekeeping operations in five theaters of the world. What it means is we have about 3,000 troops in peacekeeping, and at any time you have a certain number in peacekeeping, you must have another number on standby to take over from them. And so it means that, I don't know if it's a security, security to say what the size of our army is, but at least 6,000 <laughs> troops are committed to uh, peacekeeping in different parts of the world. And so when the Mali project came up, we needed some internal security ourselves, especially considering that we're going into elections and the aftermath of elections. And so we couldn't commit more than we did. But with things settling in, and considering that the UN is deciding to wind down some of its operations in Sierra Leone and Liberia, we can be able to commit more troops than we did initially. Okay, I'm gonna take Excellency clusters of questions now to ensure that we are able to get as many questions answered. The gentleman there, Yes, uh, there's a microphone right by you, sir. His Excellency, I'm Lekon Fatodu. Um, I'm a Nigerian and a publisher of Checkout Magazine here in the UK. Um, I would want to comment first on your um, presentation when you mentioned that um, Ghana represents, you know, the beacon for Africa at the moment, uh, which is something that particularly Nigerians are interested in. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, whenever I talk to my colleagues, I do, I do warn them that it's no longer Ghana must go, it's Ghana must stay. Because everybody is actually concerned about the political stability, economic growth, and all that. But um, in the last administration, there was an issue about um, trade exchange integration within the, from people coming into the country, which is part of the foreign direct investment that everybody is talking about that is, is essential to economic growth of any country. But Nigerians, some Nigerians are really bothered now when the issue of 300,000 threshold came up. I would like to know your policy trusts you know, in such a way that it will encourage people, genuine, legitimate, I mean legitimate businesses to thrive in Ghana. Thank you very much. Let's go right to the back there, the gentleman there. Please take a microphone. You, sir. My name is Cliff Zephyrin. Uh, Can you speak up? I can't quite yes, hear you. Yes, hi, good evening. My name is Cliff Zephyrin. I have two questions. One is in relation to the domestic environment 
and in particular the policy of generational change in political parties and government, if you can speak to that. The second is an international question, a bit of a turn of phrase with respect to Kwame and Kumar. You neither look east or west. Which direction are you looking to for capital? Looking to for? East or west, where are you looking for capital? OK. Yeah. OK, um, I want to take a third question. Let's, Madam, yep, you please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. His Excellency, my name is Priscilla Winkwell from Ben TV. So you spoke of 2012, that um, Ghanaians now have um, $1,500 per capita income. Um, recently, we note that Ghanaians, doctors, lawyers, teachers, they've been on the streets to demonstrate. We also note that the IMF also asked Ghana to look into their current public expenditure as, you know, um, if care is not taken, the economy will go into turmoil. So, sir, if you could expand as to the growth being so good, and yet ordinary Ghanaians are arguing with that. Thank you. I'm a Nigerian, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just to reassure you. <laughs> so, no, no, three questions, Excellency, if you'd like to answer them. Okay, thank you. And um, let me start from the last one, um, st strikes, yeah. <laughs> Um, in Ghana, we have something we call single spine, and um, that is a new universal salary structure based on the principle of equal pay for work of equal value. We found that we ha had a public service remuneration system that rewarded people differently, even though uh, they probably would have been doing the same work for the same employer, which was government. And so together with um, uh, organized labor, it was decided to come up with a single spine salary structure. And so we had to migrate people from their existing salary structures onto that system. Um, the process has been ongoing for a couple of years. And uh, because it's a new system, negotiations have to take place on various allowances and other remunerations that people enjoyed and how that would relate to their colleagues on, in terms of that spine. And so, uh, these things come with, you know, uh, uh, of course, uh, labor, you know, uh, differences, negotiations, always you have differences, you know, uh, in opinion. And so um, there have been discussions about we're entitled to this, we're entitled to that, but everybody looking at it from the lenses of their professional grouping. I, as president, have to look at it from the lenses of what impact it's having on the economy. Unfortunately, at the time this migration was taking place, we've been running a pay soft, uh, software that did not allow us to see what the immediate or the uh, short term to medium term impact was on the growing salary wage. And so by the time we noticed, public sector wages alone were consuming almost 60% of total revenue. And what is the size of our public sector? Half a million in a population of 25 million. And so as president, I have a duty to ensure that money is left over for maternal health, money is left over for improved quality of education and all that. And so we've been trying to hold down on the growth of uh, uh, salaries and wages. But of course, people in their own professional groupings are looking at you know, what they have gained or lost and based on that are declaring strikes we try to talk to them and let them understand what the general impact of these strikes is going to have on the economy. The economy will come crashing down. And if it comes crashing down, everybody is going to suffer. And so we are on top of it. We are improving the payroll system. That gives us immediate data on what the, the impact of the pay uh, is having on the economy. And I think that we're getting a better control of things than we did in the past. Um, of course, the issue about the deficit and our engagement with the IMF is not only because of salaries and wages, but it's also due to other factors. You must not only look on the expenditure side, you must look on the revenue side. Um, uh, Multi-donor pledges of almost 400 million Ghana CDs were never paid. And so that expenditure had been budgeted for. It didn't come into the budget. And so that led to the deficit. So it's both a revenue uh, issue and also an expenditure uh, issue. Um, we neither look east or west, we look forward. 
I use that as a metaphor for what we're doing in terms of moving our nation's progress forward. But certainly looking for capital and investment, we're looking everywhere. <laughs> 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 and, uh, <laughs> and so that's it. I mean, Ghana is lower middle income transiting to middle income. And there is quite a huge need for investment, especially economic investment. And so we're looking for partnerships that will raise that investment. Uh, that will be a win-win for both the investor and, and ourselves. And so we're looking at whole new ways of doing things. Um, there are a lot of state enterprises and other organizations that have the capacity to generate revenue and should be able to borrow on their own balance sheets. We're trying to differentiate that and take them off the public debt. And so if you want to expand the ports, for example, like the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority is trying to do now, it should not be placed on the public debt. Let the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, based on the additional revenues that will be generated by the port expansion, raise credit from the international uh, credit market and finance that port expansion. We're doing the same for VRA in power generation and uh, st several other state-owned enterprises. And so that is the kind of change we're we are making. Um, you asked a question on generational change. I didn't quite get what you wanted to allude to, but certainly I think that we all have a stake in uh, the continent's uh, progress. And I, 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 I feel that, I mean, any person, no matter what generation you belong to, if you have a relevance to move our continent forward, I mean, you should participate in whatever level you find your, yourself. And so that, that would be my answer to that. Um, with regards to Ghana must go <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, trading, I, I think that we realize that we need each other now. We, we must collaborate. I mean, all our countries on the continent and especially uh, our countries in our sub-region. Nigeria has a certain leadership role it has to take up. It's the largest economy in our sub-region. It's the most populous country in our sub-region. And so Nigeria must play a certain role in moving that whole sub-region forward. And Ghana is prepared to work with Nigeria to be able to do that. And so we must see ourselves not as adversaries, but see ourselves as partners in terms of improving the lives of our people. In the past, Nigeria has behaved unilaterally, and I don't know if you know that, closed their market to every product, no matter even that it comes from ECOWAS. And what we have done is to engage and say that, look, Ghana is no threat to Nigeria. Indeed, competition between Ghana and Nigeria would improve both of us. And so let's open our markets, let goods and services flow across the sub-region. It will inure to the benefit of every nation. And so we'll continue to do that engagement. What you're talking about is the issue about traders in markets. We have a law that says that retail trade in markets is reserved for Ghanaians. And as president of Ghana, I swore the constitution to uphold, uh, I swore an oath to uphold the constitution and the laws. Until that law is changed, you know, then you are, you, you might, you are compelled to enforce the law. But let me say that we are passing a new Investment Promotion uh, 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 Center Act, which takes cognition of these new developments. There's been no segmentation in what preferences to give. It just says all foreigners without taking recognition of the, the protocols we have as a sub-region in ECOWAS and all that. And so I hope that in passing the new Investment Promotion Center Act, it will deal with these issues. Part of the issue was you needed just 10,000 to invest in Ghana. You just had to show that you had an inward transfer of $10,000 and you could go into any sector and set up and start working. We're facing the same problem in, in mining. Uh, a lot of foreigners have invaded the mining sector. And again, the law says that small scale mining is reserved for Ghanaians. And so as president, I have a duty to enforce the law and in any case, the illegal mining activity is degrading the environment, poisoning the waters. And so I've had to take action on that. And it's controversial, but those are the risks you take in leadership. Thank you. Let's take another round of questions. So the gentleman in the middle there, Adjoa, if you just come move forward with the nice, the gentleman, no, 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 to your 
There, the gentleman there with the pink tie. Yeah. Uh, Philip Sigley, Chief Executive, Federation of Cocoa Commerce. Uh, Your Excellency, <clears throat> as you know, in your country and in West, most of West Africa, agriculture is reliant on <clears throat> the smallholder. One of the problems, and we had the G8 this week, we have had uh, nutrition on the agenda and food security. And yet, to make that transformation in terms of economic change and regional influence, the transformation of agriculture means so much. Ghana, Nigeria could produce so much in food crops as well as the cash crops. And yet, we have terrible productivity problems because of the nature of smallholder farming. What plans do you foresee going forward to be able to address these key issues when the world relies so much and seeks so much uh, for West Africa to be something of a, a breadbasket? Thank you. Thank you. So we'll get a second question. We'll go in the middle here. So the gentleman there, you, sir. There's a microphone coming just behind you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate very much uh, your speech, Mr. President. It's very brilliant speech. My question is this. It's been common in Africa that uh, today you have democracy, the next day you have coup d'etat. <laughs> so what is your strategy for maintaining the democratic process that has been achieved by Ghana as a good example for Africa? Thank you very much. Okay. And... Um, lady in the green there. Your Excellency, my name is Olubumi Ajayi from the Center for African Local Government Improvement. My question is, what is the commitment of your administration to strengthening local government so that they can deliver better services to the citizens and communities and thus be able to become a contributor to energizing local economies? Okay, you have okay. three questions. I have three here. Um, indeed, when we talk about agriculture and food security, um, Africa has a big role to play. Um, it's estimated that 60% of remaining world arable land is in Africa. The continent is crisscrossed by a lot of rivers, and so there's water for irrigation. Um, we must take, we must share the blame you know, when it comes to the state of Af Africa's ag agriculture, because for many decades in our bilateral and multilateral engagements, we were discouraged from supporting our farmers. The World Bank and IMF had a policy that African farmers must learn to compete. And so while the developed world subsidized their farmers, we were asked not to subsidize our farmers. So the poor African farmer was left to himself, productivity dropped, it is only now they realize that that was a mistake and that the world needs to produce more food. And so together with the World Bank, the IMF, and our other bilateral partners, we're looking at targeted subsidies. We're looking at you know, extension services to increase productivity of the smallholder farmers. And it's beginning to, 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 to show results. In Ghana, we have um, an inputs program where we give the farmers uh, inputs on credit, and they pay only after they have harvested their crops. We're giving them improved seeds, and I mean, farmers are seeing a jump in productivity of five, six, seven times, you know, what they were getting before. There was a case of a farmer who had kept planting the same seed, leaving some over after every harvest to replant, you know, for almost 20 years. And he was making like uh, less than half a ton per, per acre of maize. Today, farmers are seeing six tons. Uh, per, per hectare of maize, and that is uh, commendable. And um, we're beginning, Ghana, for uh, 2012, we have an overproduction of 200,000 200, metric tons of maize. And we need to be able to move that maize so that we keep a competitive price for the farmers so that it doesn't ruin them and they uh, decide not to farm again. So I think there's a new realization that we must assess the uh, uh, West African smallholder farmer and also have a mix of medium to large scale commercial agriculture. And so we're working with the World Bank on that. There's a new uh, pro program for medium to large scale commercial agriculture that we have signed for $100 million with the World Bank. 
and that is going to be put into operation together with all the work we're doing with the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa and uh, Sasakawa Foundation and all the other groups that are helping us to raise the productivity of, of our farmers. Um, democracies and coup d'etats have become unfashionable, and uh, in Ghana particularly so. Um, why are we able to sustain our democracy? I'll say uh, two things. One, everybody must have a stake in the process. Democracy is not an event, it's a process. And it needs patience, like I was saying in this speech. You don't de declare democracy, hold one election, and think that the dividends of democracy would, would be seen immediately. It takes time. It has taken Ghana that long, from 1992 to now, to see some of the progress that we, we have made, the successes that we have chalked. And so everybody having a stake and everybody being able to participate is, is one of the most uh, important things uh, that uh, we should do. And also ensure that when the dividends for democracy starts to appear, you must share it down the class chain so that every group of society is able to benefit. And that's why in Ghana, we take our social intervention program ser seriously. Recently, I've created a new ministry of gender, children, and social protection to coordinate all the social protection programs that we're engaged in to make sure that we're targeting the rights and the privileged families and helping to graduate them out of poverty. We're not inventing the wheel here. There are many best practices. Brazil has done it successfully. And so we're looking at all the best practices and trying to implement them in Ghana so that as quickly as possible, we graduate our people out of poverty. When people come out of poverty and they see that life has meaning and they can realize their potential, then they have a stake in what is going on in the country. But where you have a situation where a few people are growing richer and the bulk of the people are getting poorer, then it creates the situation for instability. And that's why in our constitution and our laws, we have a system, and that will lead me to the question on local government, that 8% of total government revenue is disbursed directly to the district assemblies, the local governments. 8% of total government revenue is shared amongst 230 five uh, districts or something like that. And they have an assembly that decides how it wants to spend the money. They make their own budgets, they decide education is a priority, we want to build school blocks, or want to build clinics, or want to use it for agriculture, or whatever they want to use it for. They decide what they want to use it for. When it happens, people have a stake in the nation, and they are willing to participate in uh, demo dem democratic transform transformation. Aside from that, in Ghana, the simple reason is we got tired of coups. <laughs> <laughs> we all had too many coups. When you, you, you dig a hole and you fall into a hole, there is how far down you can go. <laughs> if you can't go down any further, then the only option is to start climbing out. And so I guess we pioneered coup d'etats. Our first president was uh, dispatched in 1966, and after that it was a blare of, you know, uh, military rulers. And um, I guess the political class decided that, look, enough is enough. We all sign on to democratic governance. And we did so in 1992 with a constitution that has served as well and continues to serve as well. And that's what makes uh, Ghana's uh, democracy uh, robust. Local government strengthening, our district assembly's concept has been um, a model, and many countries have come to take a look at it. We have achieved political decentralization, there's no doubt about that. The next stage we need to move to is fiscal decentralization, move the resources to the districts to empower the people. It's not the easiest of things to do, I, I can assure you. Um, when people are used to holding resources at the center, they are very, very reluctant. To, to let go. And so all kinds of excuses will be made up. Oh, there's no capacity at the district level. They can't look after the money properly. It will lead to misapplication of the funds, corruption, and all that. Well, let's decentralize the misapplication of the funds and the corruption. Let's decentralize the corruption. <laughs> because who says that when the resources remain at the center, there is no corruption and misapplication? <laughs> We need to trust our people at the level to take their destiny into their own hands. And so I am a driver for pushing decentralization. And happily, I have quite a lot of support and a lot of people who 
have a very good grasp. Mr. P.V. Obing is here. Uh, Mr. Kwamna Hoy in Ghana is the godfather of decentralization. And so I have very good advices, and we're going to continue to push the decentralization agenda until we move those resources to the districts and let them, you know, take their destiny into their own hands. I'm committed to that. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> How long do you have, Excellency? All right, lady right at the back with the long white pen. Yeah, your pen. We'll take a few more than three questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Christina Katsuri, so I'm an associate fellow at Chatham House. And um, I'd like to ask two questions, please, um, Your Excellency. Can you comment on where things stand with the disputed maritime boundary with Cote d'Ivoire? How are the talks going? And secondly, I'd like to ask if your neighbor Nigeria's government has asked Ghana for help in um, dealing with the crude oil theft that is uh, being exported from uh, Nigeria into West Africa and the Gulf of Guinea. That's crude oil theft. Thank you. Thank you very much. The lady there had her hand up all the way through the last question, so over to you. Hello, Your Excellency. My name is Ya Aforiansa. I'd like to ask what the current administration is doing to help tackle youth unemployment. Ghana and Africa as a whole is a very youthful continent, and if you could also talk about um, the engagement with the private sector to help generate jobs. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take... the second part. The second part Sorry? Can, if I could also... Sorry, the second part is, would you be able to talk about um, the potential engagement with the private sector? Private sector, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, if we move here, the gentleman just here. This one, the gentleman just there. Yeah. Good evening, Your Excellency. My name's Arnold, founder of Mifri Ghana. Uh, my question was taken, actually, by the... Oh, lady. well, you can sit down there. But, but the second part of my question wasn't answered. I go to a lot of events like this, and it seems like it's the same demography in terms of age of people that are having these conversations about the future of Ghana. But the future is in the youth. And like India and Ghana, 50% of the population is under 25. If we're moving forward, how are the youth being engaged in discussions like this? Thank you very much. Concise question. Oh, the lady there. Uh, just, just there, the lady in red, just there. Oh, oh yeah, thank you. Lady in red. Um, Your Excellency, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, the, my question is really about uh, people in diaspora. And since Ghana is saying they're leaders in, on, on the African uh, continent, I just want to know what steps are you taking to give people in diaspora that vote? So, and, and I am Nigerian. <laughs> the, 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 and the lady here who's been very clever because she's moved s space because <laughs> I have a bias towards the far right so I noticed small center um, Savannah Nightingale I'm wearing my IHS Maritime hat previously uh, BBC reporting and I am a Ghanaian and some <laughs> might say an honorary Nigerian but a very very proud Ghanaian at that you've mentioned maritime a few people in the room have also mentioned it and rightfully so, because 90% of the work goods move around the world by sea. And they say if shipping didn't exist, 50% of the world would starve, the other half would freeze to death. Mm. Now, in terms of trade development, it's very essential for the continuous growth and GDP growth of the country for trade to exist. Trade can only exist if the infrastructure development is continued. That's ports, road, rail. Right now, only 10% of the roads have the standard needed to move goods successfully. What are you doing or what is Ghana doing to ensure that the intra-Africa trade is developed to enable this process? Thanks. Okay, and just behind you, the gentleman there, and then we'll certainly try one more round after this. You, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Jiro Arima from uh, JETRO, Japan External Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, Your Excellency, I understand mm -hmm. that you have just come back from Ticket 5 in Yokohama. Mm -hmm. So I'm very much interested in your perspective about ticket process and uh, more broadly Japan's contribution to the African continent. Mm -hmm. And uh, the another one is humble request because, okay. you know, because Japan is having a growing interest in the Afri African continent, so our organization is uh, in cooperation with Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry in UK. Mm -hmm. It's going to send a mission to mm -hmm. Ghana okay. in next month. Okay. Uh, from the 24th and 27th of July. Okay. So I... Uh, no, 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 no promotions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent. <laughs> 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 
Um, Excellency. Um, thank you very much. Um, let, me, let me start from the top, youth unemployment. And let me make a correction. In um, my speech after I was inaugurated, um, I made a point that it's not true in Africa to say the youth is the future. The youth is the present. Because if you take our countries, if you take people below 35, they constitute nearly 60% of the population. And so it's no longer right to say the youth is the future. The youth is now. The youth is our present. And so we need to um, uh, work to ensure that the youth is engaged and that they are able to realize their full potential. Um, if there's anything that causes me sleepless nights uh, as president, it's not any uh, uh, legal challenge to my legitimacy or any, <laughs> or any such thing. It's about youth and employment and job creation. Um, Africa, in the next few decades, is going to become the most populous continent. And also, um, probably most urbanized. Most of our, um, uh, our youth and people are moving to urban centers. So one, how do you ensure sustainable cities that guarantee you know, uh, uh, utilities and other you know, facilities to people who are in these cities. Two, how do you create jobs for young people? In Ghana, what we've been doing is, I mean, noticing that young people come out of the educational system at various levels. A lot of them come without the basic skills for the world of work. And for most entrepreneurs and businesses, they would prefer that people had skills, you know, and were ready to hit the ground and start working from day one. Most uh, uh, entities don't have the time to take you through training and all that, you know. And so one, one of the things we've been trying to do is to get the young people who are coming out of school and put them into a training or apprenticeship program to provide them with skills so that they'll be able to fit into the world of work. The next thing we need to do is to see how we can adapt our school curriculum to prepare the children more for the jobs that are being thrown up and that are available. A lot of the unemployment in Africa is structural. It is because young people are coming out of school and being trained in curriculums and courses that the labor market is not throwing up. In Ghana, we have a new oil and gas industry coming you know, we have, you know, several sectors that are looking for middle level engineers, technicians, even welders, plumbers, ele uh, uh, you know, electrical mechanics and all that kind of thing. And then you have schools throwing up marketing graduates, grammar, you know, uh, uh, graduates and so on and so forth. You're going to have a, a, a misfit in terms of what the labor market demands and what the school system is, uh, is producing. And so we're looking at all that and seeing how, well, with those coming out, how can we retrain them and make them able to be employed? But in the long, medium to long term, to fit the school system to provide the kind of skills that the labor market is looking uh, for. And so that's uh, uh, something that we're doing. You can have an economy growing, but it might not necessarily be creating jobs. And so that is another area we're looking at. And that's why we're passing legislation like the local content legislation to ensure that you know, investors who invest you know, do so in a win-win situation, both for them and for us. If you invest in our oil sector, of course, you might not be able to find somebody who fits a certain job immediately. We allow you to take in an expatriate. But in a certain period of time, you must either look for a Ghanaian who can work there, or you must train a Ghanaian to uh, uh, take that place. Also guarantee you know, services to Ghanaian companies and all that. We think that by doing that, we should be able to increase you know, the opportunities for our people in terms of jobs. Um, diasporan vote, and you say you're Nigerian. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, I understand. I understand you. I understand you. Ghana has, uh, and not only Ghana, I think Nigeria and most countries, we have quite a large uh, diaspora population. And um, this population contributes, you know, to our economies uh, in terms of remittances, you know, that they send back and all that. 
And so certainly they do have a stake in what goes on back in, in the motherland. So in Ghana, we passed the Representation of the People's Act, you know, Parliament passed it. But it takes some logistics and some arrangements to be able to uh, put that in place. And so the Electoral Commission is responsible uh, for that. I cannot give them a timetable for implementing it. But certainly, I don't think it's an issue that I'm averse to. I was in Parliament. Parliament passed it. And so it's there on the statute books. But a lot of work needs to go into implementing it. And the thing is, when we talk about the Ghanaian diaspora, people just think about Europe and London and things. I mean, they're there in Benin, they're in Guinea, they're in Gambia, they're, you know, in Greenland, they're everywhere. <laughs> you know, how you're going to put polling stations in all these areas to allow them to exercise their franchise is a huge logistical challenge. And even, you know, uh, 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 elections in our own country cost a lot of money, and it, it takes a lot of investment to be able to hold elections every uh, four years. And so it's something that uh, we will continue to look at. And the Electoral Commission is, is charged with that responsibility. Um, in Tra Africa trade, I spoke a bit about that. I said that we need to, I wish I had an eraser to erase those boundaries and allow our people and goods to move freely. We've signed all the protocols, but um, somehow uh, countries are reluctant to let the, the trade flow. And it's partly because there are some countries that, uh, for the bulk of their revenue, it comes from duties and levies on imports and transit trade and all that. And so all those uh, things are, are a bar in the way of moving people easily. Aside from that, it is the infrastructure. I mean, sometimes going from one country to the other, there are just no roads anyway to be able to move goods and services. And for a very long time, to get to some parts of Africa, you had to come to Europe and fly back. I'm sure people still do it, you know, to get to some parts of Africa. And so the transport system, like you said, is one of the areas we need to look at. Get the railways running, get the roads connected. And I'm happy that at the last uh, meeting we had in Addis Ababa, we had a follow-on meeting uh, from what we had had in Yamoussoukro of the five leaders uh, from Nigeria to Cote d'Ivoire to discuss the uh, Lagos-Abidjan uh, corridor. Uh, we held a further discussion in Addis Ababa, and all the five countries have committed to the project to build a highway from Lagos to Abidjan to allow uh, goods to move freely uh, between our countries. And if we realize that project, that would be a great step in promoting intra-African trade. That would be a first phase. And it is hoped that when we put that in place, then we can have a second phase that goes from Abidjan to Dakar. And so it should be possible for you to drive across, you know, in a reasonable length of time from Lagos to Dakar in the near future. I hope I live to uh, see that project. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, maritime, we are having an increasing incidence of piracy in the Gulf of Guinea, and that is a worrying sign. For many years, we have had to concentrate our resources on the social sector, and so improving health care and uh, education, access to education was the priority for our government, and security was not that much of a concern, and so our defense spending has, you know, uh, gone down. And so we suddenly find ourselves in a sub-region where security has become a concern with what is happening in the Sahelian region and then piracy of our coast. And we don't have the kind of equipped armed forces to be able to respond to some of these emergencies. But we must come to the understanding that there can be no democracy and progress without security. And so while we must not overinvest in security, we need to keep an eye on you know, having you know, deterrent forces that can safeguard the values that we hold so, so dear. Uh, TICAD, we had a good engagement in Japan, and um, I must acknowledge Japan's uh, interest in Africa. Um, we signed the Yokohama Declaration that included uh, several um, items for engagement between uh, Japan and Africa. And um, quite some big announcements were made, 32 billion uh, dollars for Africa over five years. Uh, that's that's fine. I'm, I, I think I'll turn I'll turn a bit to the east and see how much <laughs> how much of that I can claw for Ghana, you know. And uh, another 16 billion in ODA, 
I think that that is um, um, quite encouraging. But of course, Japan, you know, has companies that invest across the world, and I think that it is time for them to look at Africa. There are several companies from Japan, Mitsui, Marubeni, Kanmatsu, and several of them that already have set up base in uh, Ghana and are looking at the oil, energy, and power, and other important sectors. And so we'll continue to encourage them. Um, disputed maritime boundary, we are, uh, you know how it is when um, a resource is found. You live in peace until you find a resource like oil. Then suddenly everybody looks at that boundary and says, but shouldn't that line have been a bit straighter <laughs> than it was? <laughs> we had this boundary line. We all respected it. Anytime we crossed it, we informed our neighbors. Anytime they crossed, they informed us until we found oil. <laughs> and then suddenly, um, someone thinks the line should be straight. It shouldn't be curved. You know, somebody thinks it should be curved. It shouldn't be straight. But we have a vehicle for resolving these issues. We have our boundaries commission, and our two boundaries commissions are engaged. It comes at a time when we have to file for our extended continental shelf, which Ghana is in the process of doing. Cote d'Ivoire is also in the process of doing it. So I'm sure that there are safeguards in there that would make a resolution of this matter amicable. I can assure you that, I mean, our countries are sister nations in West Africa. We're not going to go to war over our common boundary. We, whatever happens, we would use legitimate means to, to resolve the issue. And then theft of crude oil, uh, we don't deal in uh, stolen crude oil from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, President Jonathan hasn't complained to me, uh, you know. <laughs> but if he does, I mean, it's something that we'll look at. Thank you. Excellency, what I'm going to do is just take three more questions. One from the far left here. So the gentleman there. No, no, the, in the middle row. Yes, you, sir. Just there, and then we'll finish after that. So my name is Simon Kaila Mohammed. I study at King's College London, and I just want to draw Mr. President's attention to the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission's offer for Ghanaian students. Like we, we all know Ghana has a brilliant policy for, for the youth, and the Commonwealth also selects students for particular courses that they think are key for the development of the country. So as soon as you finish your course, the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission mandates you to return within two weeks to go help the development of your country. Mr. President, do you have any, any plan for absorbing these Commonwealth Scholarship retainees? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a really wow. tough <laughs> task for me, Excellency, because I know you, you've got a tight timetable too. So the gentleman there with the pen in his hand, you, sir. Thank you, uh, Excellency. My name is William Pollan. I'm from Invest in Africa. Okay, can you just speak up and reintroduce sure. yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is William Pollan. I'm from Invest in Africa. You've touched already on the importance of job creation, which is something that we work on, and building capacity. And you've mentioned already the local content bill. To what extent, uh, for the newer investors and newer industries in particular, will there be time to create the progression that's needed to build that capacity? Because we found that there isn't a lack of capital, far from it, the capital is just confused and they need some simplicity. And the second question is you've touched on a load of areas today. What would you define as success for your own presidency, um, not including winning the World Cup? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna indulge this center just because there are more people here. So the lady right back there. Yeah, you madam, you've still got your hand up looking very worried, it's you. No, no, <laughs> behind you. Good evening. I just wanted to add, you'd be happy to know I'm Cameroonian, not Nigerian. Cameroonian. <laughs> Welcome. Can you speak up a bit? Um, my question is related the mic to the is, not is the mic working? Can we just... Yeah. yeah. It is. Okay, then. It's yeah. better. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> my um, question is relating to the BRICS and the development of that institution between Brazil, um, Russia, India, and China, and South Africa. Is Ghana going to get involved in development of this institution, and if it's really going to rival the World Bank? Thank you very much. Uh, so the fine. Um, <laughs> this is so difficult, excellent. <laughs> would, would you like to choose the last question? The last one? Yeah, the last one from this oh, side. Oh, boy. I'll give it to the lady. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you would be happy to know that I'm East African from Eritrea, so give you a little break from West Africans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My question is um, regarding the oil sector, and um, are you worried about the negative effects of finding oil in your, in your country, like uh, the Dutch disease, um, the disappearance of local uh, um, trades? Um, what will you do about it, and how will you tackle that? Thank you very okay. much. That's it, unfortunately. Thank you. Three last questions for you, or four, actually. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, sorry, it's been a very interesting session. I wish that we could go on and on, but um, it's been a packed you know, uh, visit, and um, I have several other engagements this evening. So I'll start from uh, Commonwealth Scholarships. Yeah, that was the first. Um, do we have a plan for absorbing uh, students back after they've uh, finished? I'm very happy there. Kamal has that policy. Two weeks seems a bit short, but I guess, you know, <laughs> getting them to come back is a good thing. Um, what we do as much as possible is to try and identify the resources that we are lacking and make sure that in selecting people for the scholarship, we're getting people trained in areas where opportunities exist. And so it won't do to come on a, a scholarship outside and do training for what we could train you for in Ghana uh, in the first place. And so that's one of the areas we would uh, look at. Aside from that, we also try to um, give scholarships to people who already are working, you know, or are in employment. And so, so that they go acquire skills, and when they come, they come back to the places where they were working. So for a lot of the scholarships, we're administering them at the postgraduate level. People would have finished the first degree, would have started working for some time already, and then we think that there are some specialized skills needed in the particular establishments in which they are, and so we send them out for training, and then when they come back, they go back to uh, their um, uh, places of work. Invest in Africa, I signed your jersey uh, the last time I was here and endorsed uh, what you're doing. I think you're doing a good job. And um, as a source of information for investment in Africa, I think Invest in Africa is doing uh, fantastic. And so I'll continue to encourage you to do that. The local content bill has been developed with widespread discussion with the industry. And so it's not something we're springing on uh, investors. It is something ourselves and, you know, uh, the investors in the oil and gas industry have discussed widely. And it's gone through parliament, it's gone, to, it's gone through, uh, cabinet has gone to parliament. It's going to go to the committee, you know, uh, of energy, and um, it's going to be discussed. And all stakeholders are going to have another opportunity to go before the committee and submit memoranda and all that, you know, uh, to the committee in respect of the law before it comes into force.